Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow, what a reception. Uh, welcome to a tour of the Student Programming with Ruby. Uh, I'm going to be your host and uh, tour guide for the next 45 minutes. My name is Mark Bates. That's me there. In case you didn't know. Proof of, uh, proof of identity. I've uh, been a Rubyist since about 2005. Um, so longer than some, but not as long as, say, Matt. <laughs> Uh, I'm a freelance consultant for Boston, um, so hire me, I think is what the, that particular bullet point said. I'm a musician, in case you couldn't tell, and I'm also an author. And this last point is actually pretty important to today's talk, as I am the author of Distributed Programming with Ruby, um, published by Addison Wesley, came out this year. Um, definitely worth looking into and reading if you're interested in distributed programming. I know it's a plug, but I have to do it. My publisher would kill me if I did it. Um, and with that said, if anybody who follows me on Twitter will know that I'm going to be giving away some free books today, which is also pretty exciting. And uh, there's just very simple rules to this little game. You got to tweet me at Mark Bates. And uh, during the slide, during the show, I've got about what five images in my slide deck from uh, TV shows and movies. So the first three people to tweet me those five TV shows and movies win a copy of the book. Pretty simple. After the Q&A, come up, see me. We'll check Twitter together. And uh, if you want a lucky few, you get a copy of the book. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, distributed programming in general is a big topic. Um, can't cover all of it in 45 minutes. That should be kind of go without saying. So I've chosen three of my favorite subjects of distributed programming, um, and we're going to kind of cover those, uh, those three areas. Those three areas are RMI, which is remote method invocation. Uh, if you're a Java person, please don't go running towards the back of the room. It's not that bad, I swear to you. Um, in the book, I do a, a little comparison of RMI and Java and RMI and Ruby, and the Java one's like three pages of code to say hello world, and in Ruby, it's like three lines. So it's, it's, it's much more fun and really cool in, uh, in Ruby. We're also going to talk about messaging queues, a very hot topic. Several people have talked about them already. Um, and we're going to kind of go into what they are and some, uh, some little more detail into them. And we're also going to talk about background jobs. These were the three that I managed to actually get into a 45-minute presentation. Um, I wanted to talk about MapReduce. I wanted to talk about web services. Um, but there's just not enough time to be really interested in those subjects. I highly recommend the book, it covers all of them. Okay, so let's talk about uh, how we're gonna do this today. Right, we're gonna talk about the who, the what, the when, and the why of each of these subjects. Um, not so much the how, and I'll talk about that in a minute. What I really want you to do is walk away from this talk knowing what a message queue is, or what a background job is, when you should use it, why you should use it, um, and then who are the kind of big players uh, in each of these areas. Um, it's very important, uh, a lot of people come to these conferences and you sit in the back of the room and you listen to the talk and you think, oh, that's fucking cool technology, and you go home and you use it, and you're not using it the right way. And it's not that you're doing it wrong, you're not programming it wrong, you're just not using it when you should be using it. So it's very important to understand when you should be using these technologies and why you should be using them, not just because they're cool technologies. And that's really what I want you to pull away today. So I know you're talking, you're just probably saying to yourself, you know, the how is why we're here. We want to figure out how to do these things. Um, so what's the point if we're not going to talk about the how? And, and again, it's really about the when and the why. Very important, we will look at code. We will talk about the code uh, to help illustrate the points about each of these technologies. Um, but to go into them into detail that they need to be covered in, it's too much for 45 minutes. Um, and I've seen too many talks where it's just code after code after code, and they're flying through it, and you don't really get anything out of it. Um, so take this away, again, check out the book perhaps, a lot of great uh, in-depth coverage there to get into the how of all of this stuff. Okay, this by the way is uh, image number two, for those of you keeping track of the free books going. Um, we're going to talk about remote method invocation now. Um, some of its aliases that you might know by are DRB, DRuby, Distributed Ruby, um, those are a few of the ones here. So what is it? Well, the name kind of gives it away. It gives you the ability to call methods remotely. Um, talk to a server, client, talk together, call methods, serialize data back and forth. Um, pretty cool stuff, as you'll see. It's in the standard library, so no additional packages uh, needed. Very quick to get set up. You can get set up right now when 
you're fast enough, you can actually copy down the code that I'm, uh, I'm going to put up in these slides and actually run these examples locally. They're that, that easy to get up and running. Um, so they're also, it's also very, very easy, very, very powerful to use. As you'll see, we do some really cool stuff very quickly. Um, it is also extremely dangerous. Um, and we will talk about security here uh, in a little bit. I'm not going to go into great detail, but I will show you a very quick way to wipe out an entire server's file, for, uh, file uh, system in three lines of code using this. Um, so there is definitely an edge of danger here, and uh, you want to heed that as you go forward. So when and why do we want to use DRB uh, in our applications? Well, said very fast and easy to get set up and running, built into the standard library, no problems there. Almost zero configuration, and you'll see this in a minute, when using straight DRB, almost zero configuration. That's not including SSL um, and that sort of stuff, but just to get up and running in your dev environment, pretty quick. No need for any of the standard web services stuff you use, no need for controllers or JSON or Apache or Nginx configurations. You fire up two standard Ruby files and you're off and running. Um, and most importantly, when would you use this? You use this in a closed environment. You don't want to offer this up to the public. You don't want to say, hey everybody, my DRB port is port 8080, feel free and start you know, calling remote methods on it. You don't want to do that. You want to do it internally, behind firewalls, in a closed environment. Um, as you'll see when I show you that security example, why that is important. Okay, so here's a quick little graph that kind of shows what a typical round trip would look like when using a remote method invocation. We have a client here, right? And the client uh, sends a message to the Hello World server saying, say hello for me. The Hello World server says, I got that message, I know what to do with it. I'm gonna respond with a string, hello world. It serializes up that string, sends it back down to the client, the client then deserializes that string and does whatever it wants with it. And like, serialization is very, very important to what we're gonna talk about and is how this whole thing works. Everything is serialized between these two and the deserialization, as you'll see a little later, is also incredibly important. So let's look at a quick little demo here. Um, I need to uh, build a central authentication system. I've got 10, 10 or 20 apps. They're all these big apps and every one of them has usernames and passwords. What I really need is a system where I can send the username and password to it. It's going to check it against the database or whatever way it checks to verify those uh, username and password is correct. Then it's going to send back a hash of information about that user to me. Um, and then I can do with it as I want. And if not, I want to send some sort of message that says it's been a security breach. So let's look at how we would do this using DRB. Obviously, we could do it with CAS systems that are already built, but this is kind of a little more fun. So we have a user service class here. It's a standard Ruby library, a standard Ruby class, nothing special about it at all. On this class, we have an authenticate method. It takes a username, takes a password. We run it against this incredibly complex algorithm um, for determining whether they're a valid username and password. If they are, we send back some uh, details about this person as a hash. And if not, we return a string that says there's been a security breach. What's really interesting about all of this is down the bottom of this file here, and unfortunately, people in the back probably have a hard time seeing it, uh, there's this one line that says start service. We give it a user, we give it an IP address and a port, and a copy of the instance uh, of the, uh, an instance of the user service class. So we're going to bind the instance of this user service class to that uh, IP address and port, so that other people can then call authenticate method, the authenticate method on it. That's all we've done. We're going to run this in a file, and it's going to sit there and wait for people to send in messages. So our customer service app that we're going to build for this. Very simple, the, people, the customer service reps just need to know the username and password so they can retrieve your details and say, oh yeah, your email address is mark at markbase.com. So we're gonna to connect uh, to that IP address and port that we specified earlier, um, get a copy of the user service back, and then in our loop here, we're just gonna keep asking for username and passwords, and then we're gonna call the authenticate method on it, on that user service we got, and pass it the username and password. That's, honestly, that's all you need to do to actually get DRP running. <coughs> So here, let's actually run it. In the top panel, we have our user service. In the bottom panel, we have our client. Um, so I'm going to type my username here of Mark Bates and my password of bad password, see what happens. And I have a security breach, which is exactly what I want to happen. If I type my correct username and password this time, I get the, uh, the hash down the bottom here. So I get the string of the hash, the inspect of the string, uh, inspect of the hash, rather. Print out the box, my username, my email, my created app date. Everything works great. If you look at the top here, you can see that I'm printing out that I'm trying to authenticate the user. 
that was it. There was no third server I had to run, um, no third file I had to kind of implement, no Apache settings I had to do. I now can, I can now use this hash in my client to do whatever I want. I get the email off it, print it to the screen, send them an email, change their email, do whatever I want in this hash, and it's there. So what happened was I asked the remote server, authenticate this, here's user and password, I serialize that, send it to the service. The service then found the hash, serialized the hash, sent it back down to the client, the client deserialized it, it created a hash object, and then gave it to me. Now we want to get a little more fanciful with it, right? We want to actually get return a user object because that's what all of our apps are using. They're going to use a user object. So we're going to change our service here just slightly. Um, and instead of a hash, we're just going to return a user object instead. That's it. That's the only thing that's changing our service. Um, here's what our user object looks, looks like. Pretty straightforward. Uh, pretty standard Ruby code. And in particular to note down here is our 2S where we're going to print out a nice uh, active record-esque type of two-string on this. Um, okay, so if we're going to run our fancy user service again this time, and we're going to type in Mark Bates and our password to password. Let's see what happens. Okay, well we got a response. We didn't get a security breach, but we did get a DRB unknown object. Um, and uh, the question is, why do we get a DRB unknown object? In the last example, we got the hash, and the hash worked just fine. We should be seeing the 2S of our user object. And the answer is very simple. When we, sent, we serialized up the hash and deserialized it on the other end, Ruby knew what a hash was. It had the class definition of hash. It does not have a class definition for user. So how do we solve that? Well, we can solve it by creating a class definition of a user in both environments, but then it's not very dry. Um, or we can maybe put it in a gem and bundle up the gem and install the gem in both places. Not the greatest solution either. But Ruby has our backs here. So what we can do is we take our user class and we can have one line, this DRB on dump line. And for those of you who've ever seen this line before and wondered exactly what it does, when I was writing the book, I was really diving into the source code of this and, and looked up this module to find out what this module does. And all this module does is includes one method into your class, the underscore dump method. And all that method does is raises an exception. That, that, that's it. That is all that, that module does, includes a method to raise an exception. Um, so what happens is when uh, Ruby tries to serialize this class up and send it down the wire, it gets the exception and says, okay, I don't know what to do with this, so what I'm going to actually do is send down a reference to this object. I'm not going to send down the actual object itself. So that looks a little like this. Right? So our client sends a message to the user service saying, find the user with the ID of one. User service says, okay, I'm going to send it back to you, but I can't. So what I'm actually going to send back is this DRB object that contains a reference and the reference ID of the actual user object, which is now stored on the user server as opposed to being sent back down to the client. The client then uses that reference as if it was local and says, okay, well, I need to print out the username to the screen now. So it calls dot username on this you know, potential user object. And what that does is actually sends a message back up to the server saying, here's my reference ID, here's the message I want, do something with it on this side, and then it serializes up and sends down the response on the other side. So let's actually see this work this time that we include our DRB and dumped, and hopefully it will work so it's pre-recorded. Um, so use name mark Bates. <laughs> you never know with demos, you really don't. Okay, great, so we got what we expected. We see the nice, beautiful two-string down the bottom. So it did work, um, which, is, which is fantastic. Now there's two things wrong um, with what I just showed you. And, and most importantly, uh, I'll actually start by saying don't do this. Don't ever do this. And, and the reason is, like I said, there's two things wrong with it. The first thing is, it's incredibly slow. Every time I make a method call on this object, it serializes up that method call and any parameters you send to it back up to the server. The server is now responsible for chugging on it and doing all the processing, not the client. Once it gets that information, then serializes it, sends it back down the pipe, and then has to be deserialized again. This is every single time you make a method call. With the hash, we had a local copy. Here, we don't. So you're passing on these user objects, and now everybody's just talking and overloading that main service. Not a good idea. The second reason is security, and I will show you that in just one second. But one last thing I kind of want to point out here is you can see we're printing out asking for email up here in the top service, which was in my user class. And uh, I wanted to point that out just so that you saw that it was actually executing on the server side, not the client side, when we called self.email uh, in the inspect. Okay, so this is uh, slide number three of images. So this is the danger we were talking about, 
right? Um, when DRB encounters a class, a method on a class that it doesn't know uh, in the client, it sends that message up to the server and says, hey, can you do me a favor and execute this method on your side because I'm hoping you have a copy of it. And the server says, yeah, I'll try my best and I'll do my best for you. So what happens if you take an undef a method uh, that is on, say, every object um, in Ruby? You undef it on the client side. What's going to happen is it's going to make that method call on the remote side. So if we have a class, a little Ruby file that looks like this, and we get our DRB object, and we undef instance eval on that, and then we call instance eval with rm-rf star. Do not run this code, by the way. Anybody ever run this code, please? Um, I really can't stress that enough. Uh, I've never actually run this code. I'm taking on faith this code works. Um, so please do not do it. So we undef instance eval, then we call it on the remote object. It doesn't know what to do with it, so it calls back up to the server, and then it says, oh, I know what instance eval is. I'm going to run it. And then it runs the system command and destroys our entire file server. Not a good idea. Please do not run this. Ruby does have our back. There are flags you can set that prevent the entire family of evals from running. And I highly recommend you set them on every single DRB file you ever write. Um, regardless, you only need to set it once, but set it on every single file. Because you can never have it set enough times. <laughs> That's what I can really say about that. But okay, so that's, that's kind of DRB in, in RMI in a quick little nutshell here. There's a lot more you can do with it, and I really recommend going deep dive into it. When you set up uh, ring servers using Rinda, now all of a sudden you can have automatic uh, service discovery, so we can get rid of these nasty IP addresses and ports, and actually start looking for objects and, and kind of checking objects out of the service and putting them back in again. Uh, a lot of really fun stuff you can do with this. But again, there's always that, that, that caution, and I can't caution you enough, just how unsecure this can be. Every instance, every object you share, and every object you send down the pipe, any method on it is now available. This is not a web service where you say, here are my half a dozen endpoints, you can only call these, and then I'm going to control them, and I'm not going to call a val on any user params you sent through, at least you shouldn't. Um, I'm sure somebody out there is, and is in for a surprise one day. Um, you're not in control of that anymore. I can call any method, and I can undef any method. This is Ruby, we can do whatever the hell we want with it, remember? Um, so really be very, very careful with it. But it is a lot of fun, and you can do some really cool shit um, with it. And again, the, the book goes into a lot of examples and a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, definitely check it out. Okay, so who are the big players in this area? Um, well, DRB and Render are really the biggest players. Um, there have been a few others that have tried, um, but kind of fall off the line. Um, there's a little gem I wrote called Distribunot. Uh, which wraps a lot of this kind of stuff and does a lot of cool magic where it automatically looks up objects uh, in a namespace and finds them in services and locks them and checks them out and does all sorts of cool stuff. So if you're going to use it, I would definitely recommend uh, checking that out. Okay, so message queues. This is slide number four, I think. Now, I, I was just about to say his name in the speedy delivery, but I'm not going to. So what are message queues? Well, they're also known as asynchronous message queues, although there are synchronous message queues, but they're not the norm. There are active message queuing protocols, a big protocol for them, or AMQP. So what are they? Well, I think the name kind of gives it away. They're a stack of messages um, to queue. You put messages into it, messages come out on the other end. It, they typically run on a FIFO system, so first in, first out. Um, you know, you put a message at the top, message comes next message, the bottom message comes out. Obviously, when it's processed. Uh, fire and forget. There is typically no interaction between the person putting the message on there, or the queue, and then the queue sending back some sort of message to that, to that person. You typically put the message on the queue, and then that's it. Let the queue do what it does. And maybe it puts another message on another queue that you pull off later. Um, but that's not really kind of uh, that, that kind of communication. It's very fire and forget. So when and why would we use a message queue? Right? Well, they're extremely fast and efficient. Um, incredibly fast. Most of them, uh, like RabbitMQ is written in Erlang, um, so it's incredibly fast. Reliable delivery, they all offer reliable delivery. Um, you can turn off persistence on them all, um, but if you turn off persistence, they're incredibly, they're even more fast, um, but you kind of lose reliable delivery. They are immediate. So typically, the, uh, the message itself is not actually stored. You know, when you send a message to data, you send an object to a database, you say, here's my object, store it. I wait for a response from the database saying it's been 
story. With message queues, you say, here's a message, and then you leave. You don't get a response saying it's been stored. It doesn't say, hold on a second, let me just make sure that it's a good message. You just, just takes the message and you walk away from it. So very immediate in terms of, uh, in terms of that. And typically there are several workers or processes per queue that are constantly kind of being pushed all these messages and they're constantly working. And this is a, a, an important difference when we look at background jobs in a little bit. Uh, it's one of the things that differentiates background jobs and message queues. Um, here you said you have you know, three or four or ten processors all working on one queue. And they're also very good for inter-process communication. So you have several apps, you want to put a message on, the, you know, a, uh, app A puts a message on there for app B, app B comes along, picks it up and says, oh, thank you, you know, this person's registered, so I'm going to send an email now, um, or do something fun like that. Okay, so we're going to do a little demo. Um, for this demo, I use Starling, which is a Ruby-based messaging queue. It was originally written by this uh, little startup in California called Twitter. Um, they used it for a while, I don't think they're using it anymore. Um, it's it's a it's a fun little uh, sorry fun little uh, message queue. I wouldn't really recommend it for high scale production because it is all Ruby based, um, but it's very easy to get up and running, get started, which is why I use for these demos. Um, typically, I use RapidMQ, which is fantastic, but it's a lot more work to kind of get up and running um, and to kind of do some of the examples. So I thought simplicity was best for practical demonstration. So let's see what we got here. So. We're gonna, we, we're gonna connect to the server, Starling server, and all we have to do is run a, the Starling command, the command line to start up the server, and we'll show you that in a second, on a particular address and port. And then we're gonna ask you for something silly to say, and then that message, uh, whatever you say, is gonna get shoved onto the logging queue uh, with a timestamp. It's a basic little logging system here. Um, so imagine we have our application, every time a user comes to our app, we're gonna send the request information, just pop it onto this queue, and then we're going to process it in our logger. Later, we're going to do analytics. We're going to do all sorts of heuristics on it right then and there, um, instead of just writing it to a file. So here's our logging queue. It's very simple. We're just going to uh, loop through the queue. We're going to flush the queue. So every time there are messages in the queue, they're going to get popped up into this block. And we're going to print it to the screen. And that's it. That's all we need to do to get Starling kind of up and running and going and connecting to our logging server, a logging queue. So let's look at examples. At the top here, we're going to start Starling. It's very simple. Get rid of that. We're going to start our log worker. It's going to sit there and wait for stuff to go in. Now it's going to ask me a question. I have something to say? Yes, I'm going to say hello, RubyConf. And then boom, it shows up right there at the top. With the timestamp we put it in, which obviously was a few days ago, <laughs> Wednesday. Um, and then another another one down the bottom. So that's it. So imagine the power of that. Um, to do some really cool stuff. In this case, I'm using logging as an example. Logging is a great example of message queuing, right? Because we're always wanting to do stuff with our logs. Why not pop them on there very fast? It's probably faster um, than writing to a disk when you've got all those files, all everybody trying to write to that same file. Putting stuff on a queue can be very, very fast. And then let it do processing and formatting and whatever you want, write it to a database or create a pie chart on the other end. All right, so show you a little more interesting example. We're going to create a number queue, and from this number queue, we're going to send it uh, space delimited numbers, we're going to add those numbers up in our queue. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. If you don't know what this Ruby code is, I can't help you. Uh, so here we go, it's our client. What numbers do you want to add? And it's going to set them on the queue. Here we go, we're on a number adder. Here's some numbers. Two and two is four. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine should equal 45. There we go. So there we're going, doing something a little more interesting. We're giving it kind of a, a message, we're saying, do this thing, add these numbers together. Um, so you can do some fun stuff with it. You can't really send complex objects, um, but that's probably a good thing. You know, I could, probably could have created some sort of number adder class and sent that along with all my attributes. Um, I probably, I could also have sent an array, it can deal with basic uh, stuff. You really want to try to stick with your very basic class types um, when dealing with messages. One, because if you're creating these large objects, you're really starting to feed the point of that immediacy. Um, just, just take what you have and send it um, as quick as you possibly can. Don't create large, complex objects. Let the, let the processor do that. Just send over the string. I just sent over a string of numbers that I grabbed. I didn't split them. I didn't send over an array. I didn't spend the time on the client side to do it. Use that immediacy to your advantage. Let the server, let the uh, processor do that work for you. That's what it's there for. Okay, so who are some of the big players uh, in, this, uh, in this area? 
where we talked about RabbitMQ, which I said is my favorite, uh, one I use all the time, love it, uh, along with the AMQP gem, fantastic. Uh, Starling, very good, if you're just getting started, you want to play with this stuff today, Starling is really easy to do um, and get up and running very quickly. Um, and ActiveMQ, I don't really have any, uh, any uh, experience with it, but I've heard lots of really good things, so uh, check it out if that's, if that's your thing. Last image, get your tweets in. Um, background jobs. And if, by the way, if you guys don't know who this is, I mean seriously, if there's somebody like, I got the first four, I am totally lost with these two. Um, honestly. Just, you'd be surprised, I guess. Um, it's actually my son's favorite show, it's great, which is really sad. Um, anyway, so, so no one else is on background jobs here. Offline tasks, background workers, you've probably heard them referred to as that. Just by a show of hands, how many people actually use background jobs in their apps today? Okay, so a decent amount of people, that's good. That's good. You should be. Um, so what are they? Right? Well, they're dedicated workers to a dedicated task. I probably should have put that on there. Um, that's, and that's a big differentiator from a message queue. Message queue, a bunch of processes just sucking on information and doing something with them. Here you're actually bundling up information about a very specific task, and that could be a whole bunch of information from instance variables to message IDs, you know, user uh, object IDs, to whatever it is you need to do, large images, whatever, you're bundling it up and saying, here, process this when I tell you to process it in the background. <coughs> it typically uh, use priority uh, and run at queue ba uh, based queues, so instead of uh, first in, first out, you want to tell it, well, this, this worker, this job is more important than this other job. Um, the example I always like to use is every site, uh, most websites will send you a welcome email when you register, when you confirmation, like you click on it, it confirms your email address. And a lot of sites will also send you an email when, say, you have a to-do that's overdue, right? Well, what is more important, welcome email or the to-do's overdue? And obviously, the to-do's overdue is the most important of those two emails. Okay? Um, <laughs> obviously, it's the welcome email. So you want to shove that in there as urgent and run at now, and the other one, you might want to say, you know what, kind of low priority if it gets delivered at midnight tonight like I wanted to, that's great, it gets delivered at 12.05, I don't really care, if it's something more important, do that. They're also fire and forget, um, but without the kind of immediacy. Um, and the reason they're usually uh, without the immediacy, as you've seen in a minute, they're typically um, database backed or stored by some sort of um, service somewhere, typically database, um, and you're kind of, you have to kind of build the object before you save it, uh, before you give it off to the, the queue. Okay, so when and why do we use these? Well, here's a few good examples, right? If you want to process large files, that person uploads that 10 megabyte avatar, well, that's not gonna be, you need to cut up some thumbnails for it. You don't want to do that while the person's waiting, right? You want that to happen offline, and then you know, show them a little uh, shadow avatar while, you, while it's processing, and then start populating their avatar whenever they go around the site. Offload long, long running tasks. One of my favorite examples of this is every site typically has <laughs> The invitation system, where you paste in all your friends' email addresses, type them a little message, and then you spam them with links to the site to get them to join because you get that referral bonus or something. Right? So that works great. You know, you put in 10 email addresses, fine, it's going to send out 10 emails. Not the best. I mean, what happens if the SMTP server is down or there's some other reason why it starts getting slow? But what happens if you type in 1,000 email addresses or 10,000 email addresses? Right? You're going to sit there and let the person wait. They click the submit button and then it's going to sit there and send out 10,000 email addresses, uh, emails? That sounds like an awful user experience to me. Why not take it, shove it in a job, and let that job then sit there and spend its cycle sending out 10,000 email addresses and retrying again if one of those addresses fails or the SMTP connection is down. And just return back to the user and say, thank you very much, we sent your emails. They'll be none the wiser. All right, like I said, they're typically database backed, so they're very easy to usually get started with. You usually have a database in your application. Um, and again, if priority is important to you, then this is definitely a win over a message queue. And they're also great for recurring tasks. Um, I know you can say, well, we've got cron, we can just run a cron job every night at midnight to do my, you know, my to-dos, or every hour to calculate up how much this person has used in bandwidth, or every five minutes to pull down that hashtag from Twitter. Uh, yeah, you could write cron jobs to do all of those things, but what if you don't have cron? Or you're on Heroku, right? Heroku, you have to pay for an hourly cron. You're not going to get that five-minute Twitter cron going. Recurring tasks. 
Very good. They also will self, you know, you can set them to self and re and queue. Uh, they'll retry for you if there's a problem. It's a great solution to that cron problem. And writing cron jobs kind of sucks. I'm not going to lie. So let's do a little demo. I scratched my head trying to come up with a demo to show you that demonstrates um, long running background processes and stuff like that. So, what I came up with was a little uh, newsreader app. It's going to be the killer newsreader app. Everybody's going to go flock to it by the end of this uh, tutorial. And what I want to do is I want to create a, uh, add a URL. I just want to go and actually all the articles from that news feed. Pretty straightforward. I have this active record class here, right? It has many articles. And then on my after save, so every time I save this, I'm going to go and get my, my uh, articles here. I'm going to aggregate them using this aggregate method. So I connect to the URL that I have. I parse the feed. I then loop through the entries of that feed. And I create my article objects. And then my server gets a little sleepy after it does that, so it takes a little second break. And then does the next one. So if you have 20 to 30 articles, it's going to take 20 to 30 seconds minimum to run. That's not including the length of time it takes here to actually connect to the site, length of time it takes here to parse the body, loop through them, do the database creation here, and all that fun stuff. So let's actually see what happens when we try to do this from a user's perspective. I create my Netflix news feed here. I'm going to get the new releases. I click Create Feed. You can see down here it's processing. And uh, we're still processing. And this is just a great user experience. I mean, this is, this is wonderful. What happens if that news feed timed up? Then my session, my, my browser's going to time out, or, or if it takes longer than 30 seconds or a minute, my browser's going to time out, and then everybody's going to freak out thinking that didn't create, so you get that big error message, and I can create it again, and maybe it's going to do it again. And it's just not very good. If we look down here at our log, right, we can see that it took a total of just over 25 seconds for that to actually return back. Now granted, they have here, here are their, uh, their movies and their, their articles rather up here in the top. Uh, I believe that's Jonah Hex. So obviously a good one. Um, but it's, it's, so it's there now. But now every time they say this, this is what's going to happen. It's going to take the 25 seconds to get a response back to the server. And that is just an awful user experience. So how can we use a background job? Now this could obviously have been an image or anything. Uh, so how do we change that? How do we make this work? Well, let's change our feed class around just a little bit here. Instead of in the after save, instead of calling the aggregate method, we're going to call this the queue worker method. Right? All that's going to do is call this aggregate worker class, going to enqueue it, and give it the ID of the feed. That's it. That's all it's doing. So now when I click save, it's going to enqueue a worker and complete. It's going to come back to the user. Nothing else changed. So here's my aggregate worker. I'm using a delayed job under the covers, uh, which is a great a great system for doing uh, background jobs. And uh, using a gem I wrote called DJ Remixes that gives you unique workers, re workers, hopped hook support, some hooks, some really kind of cool, fun stuff. Using 